Welcome back, everybody, to SJG Perspective. This is a recap of episode number one, Wagging the Moon Doggy. In episode number one, we covered censorship on the moon landing hoaxers, meaning that every place you look from YouTube to Google and everywhere in between, the first results you get when you search for moon landing hoax are going to be debunking sites, sites that say anybody who believes in such a thing is a batshit crazy tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theory loony flat earther crazy person. They absolutely have implemented and done a damn good job of implementing the ridicule and mocking campaign of all hoaxers who call foul on the information about the moon landing. We covered that. We also covered which led the whole cognitive dissonance of the moon landing being faked. Cognitive dissonance we covered was something in your brain when facts are saying, yeah, there's no way this could be true, but everything in your brain has been programmed to say, yeah, this is true. So you get a dissonance that just goes inside of your brain. A couple reasons for that. First reason was that was such a great time of our life and man, we went to the moon and the USA was awesome and man, we just did it. We beat everybody to the moon. It was just this great time and, uh, of, of our life and of our nation, uh, national, our nation's history and yeah, it's just inbred within us, inbred within us, inbred within us to say we went and it was great. Number two reason why people don't want to believe it, can't believe it, will not believe it, absolutely laugh at you if you say, I don't think we went to the moon is because fear good old fear because the fear is if they did lie to us about this and if the moon landing really didn't happen as the mainstream narrative likes to tell us that it did anything our government tells us could be a lie and what else is a lie from our scientific community to our educational community to our government angel uh, governmental agencies if this was a lie everything could be a lie so we live in fear but here's the question we also talked about if everything within your brain when you look at all the evidence tells you something is true but everything all the sources around you tell you it isn't true do you decide that you're going to trust your own cognitive abilities and your own common sense and your own reasoning or are you just going to deny your common sense and your common reasoning for the very same for the very fact that you are just going to go along with the mainstream story because everything else is way too hard and painful we covered that debunkers one of the things the debunkers said we covered in the last episode was that there's no way you could keep a conspiracy this big man you just can't do it dude there's thousands of people who know about it there's no way you could have kept everybody in your little club and we debunked that one of the ways we debunked that was by saying that you wouldn't need to actually have thousands of people in on the conspiracy you would only need to have a select few or a, a chosen few if you will that are hoaxing everybody else it's been done before it'll be done again then we talked about when things don't add up which i think i already talked about this and i'm getting ahead of myself on the notes but we talked about when things don't add up in our own brain do you trust your cognitive ability or do you blindly follow the narrative then we also touched on this lie has to be really big Big, big lies like Adolf Hitler said are the ones that people believe because it's such a big lie. How the hell could it really be fake? But then we also talked about how this lie has to have an expiration date, right? They have to have an expiration date. How long can we actually go without doing it again or even coming close to doing it again without people starting to ask, did we really do it? Because if we did it back in the 1969, 1970s and we can't do it now and we have problems doing it now, what's the deal here something's not adding up then we also ran down how the russians were kicking our ass the russians were kicking our ass when it came to space when it came to the space programs and we listed out all the points i'm not going to list out all the points if you want to hear all the points go back and watch the first episode maybe i'll do a clip clips of the first episode so you don't have to watch the whole first episode because it was an hour but the russians take my word for it we're kicking our ass and up until the point we did the first Apollo mission, we were trailing the Russians. And then poof, magically, all of a sudden, the Russians just didn't even try anymore. They just gave it up. They didn't even have any desire to go to the moon once we went to the moon. No one else has ever came, gone, not even came close. We touched on that. We touched on the 1960s technology that we had that allegedly put us on the moon. And we've compared that against what our technology is now and how now we say we still have to jump over some te- technolo- technological 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 hurdles to get back to the moon. 1960s, we could do it, but now we still have to, we have to clear some stuff up. 1960s, technology of a toaster. Today, technology of a, let me switch it around, a smartphone, a super, supercomputer in the palm of our hand. These, we all have them, just they, they, a phone in our hands. Think about what NASA has. And NASA still says they have te- technological problems on getting back to the moon. Moving on. 
it wasn't as too expensive. That's another reason people say, well, we don't go back to the moon because it's too expensive. And hey, we've learned everything we need to learn from the moon. Because if we went to Earth six times from some other spa, some, some other planet or some other Martian aliens came to us, I'll do that. Some other Martian aliens came to us, right? And they were here and they came six times and they landed on the Earth. They'd learn everything they needed to learn about the Earth, right? Right? Hmm. Interesting. Farthest we've ever gone away from the Earth since this time, since going to the moon, which the moon is 234,000 miles away, the farthest we've ever gone away from the Earth is roughly 400 miles away from the Earth. And the medium average of what we've actually done, most of our space travel, most of our space exploration with the space shuttle program, yada, yada, the space station, so on and so forth, is roughly two to 300 miles away from the Earth. And the moon is 234,000 miles away from the Earth one way. That's a one-way ticket, just one way. One way is 234,000 miles. And and since then, since the 1960s, the farthest we've gotten away from the Earth is 400 miles. Touched on that. Uh, we talked about the glitchy video, man. Back in the 1990s, man, it was hard to get a, a, a video without glitching when we were trying to stream our uh, our uh, um, fear. What was it? Ah, oh, fear, pain. What was it? When we bombed the shit out of Iraq and we were f filming that, we had glitchy video right then. But in the 1969, 1970, we had video that was streamed 234,000 miles from the moon to the earth, and there wasn't so much as a glitch in it. Now, you say, well, the video I watched was really grainy. Well, we also brought that up because actually nobody has ever seen, which we touched in the first episode, nobody has ever actually actually watch the original footage. All of the footage that you watch, that you see, that you YouTube was shot was a reshot footage, meaning they had the technology to shoot back a video stream from the moon to NASA so we could watch them walk on the moon live. They had the technology to do that, but they couldn't figure out how to how to actually take that live footage that was coming in, plug it into whatever boxes they needed to, and then stream it out to the rest of the world live. So how they did it and what you have seen and I have seen and everybody's seen is they played the footage on a little black and white monitor. I don't know how big it was. Probably yay by yay, whatever. And then they sh they refilmed it with a video camera. You know how you do this? I guess it would be like this. Refilmed it with a video camera camera of course it wasn't a, a roll like this where they had to actually roll we were a few years past that was actually having to do this to videotape something so they just videotaped that and then shot that out live to everybody nobody's seen the live footage and the reason nobody's seen the live footage and now nobody can see the live footage which we touched in the first episode is because all footage has been lost all data has been lost all tele telemetry data has been lost all biomedical records have been lost everything has been lost we also touched on the fact that the only cool things the astronaut did when they were on the moon was drive a dune buggy around and hit a golf ball. That's it. They're in one sixth gravity of Earth, and all they wanted to do was drive a dune buggy around, which would have been cool, which we'll get into the next episode, which we're going to get into today, the next episode of how the hell did they get a dune buggy to the moon? But all they did was drive a dune buggy and hit a golf ball. Seemed a little weird. So taking all this into account, we have no way to verify the following. 1960, the 1960s technology that made it possible for us to get there. We have no way to verify the physical data that made it possible for us to get there. We have no way to verify the fuel consumption that made it possible for us to get there. And we have no way to verify the footage proving it was possible that we were there because it's all been lost gone. Bye-bye. So coming up in this next episode, we're going to start it off with the moon rocks. Stay tuned. We're coming at you right now. Shut up and show us the money. All right. My sister just said, shut up and show us the money. Well, you know what? We're going now, Kim. So you can just relax. Okay. Dave, questions on the recap. Well, I think, um, I don't know that if I have a question as much as a comment, kind of what runs through my mind when I think about all this is, um, you know, there's a saying that says the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah. And it seems like after World War II, for the latter half of the 20th century, the, um, uh, the majority of the mistakes that were made by the United States, I think were done with good intentions because there was a healthy fear of communism and I'm no fan of communism, it's never worked ever. Right. Um, uh, and and uh, I think rightly so, we were concerned about communism because there was a cold war on. But a lot of that fear, um, fear motivation ended up causing a bunch of problems and a lot of ills and it's you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. you can go back and go oh yeah well shoulda coulda woulda but um and 
like I'm thinking of the Vietnam War. Um, I just recently watched Ken Burns' um, uh, documentary on the Vietnam War. And we got into that whole thing because we were afraid of the domino effect. Because, again, we were afraid of communism, the Cold War, and a lot of the mistakes that we made in the 20th century, I think, had to do with our fear of communism and our, and, um, our willingness to bend the rules in order to come out ahead of, of Mother Russia. Yeah, right. Uh, and so, and what you're touching on here is if, if this turns out to be true, what you say is true, oh, true. that we true. were that we were terrified that they were going to win the Cold War because they were yeah. sending out Sputnik and monkeys and all sorts of stuff up into space. Um, right. I think I think it's possible that it could have started with the best of intentions, which yeah. again was to kick communism's ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think what it did was it opened Pandora's box because once the government realized they could do it, oh, believe that they'll swallow that. <laughs> right. You could you could extrapolate and look back on other events that happened and then realize that once they realized they got away with that, yeah. they were able to get away with a bunch of other stuff. No, and you know, it's funny. I touched on that in the first episode, too, where I said, I understand why they lied. They lied for, if you can say, noble reasons, too, because the one thing we kicked at the whole world's ass on is is in Hollywood is in movies, was in production, was in, you know, all everything to do with entertainment. We kicked the rest of the world's ass on. So I understand them saying, we need to take the wind out of the sails of our enemies, and we need to say we've gone there, we need to make it believable, and we need to do it. And I get it, and I'm like, it was pretty brilliant, and hey, props to doing it. I mean, I'm pretty impressed you guys pulled it off. It's pretty amazing you did that. But it still makes it bullshit, and I think it's time that people understand. Nope, it was bullshit. We are now the. The problem is, the problem is, once you let that cat out of the bag, once you know that that it happened, it, it's it's kind of. It does what I said before. All of a sudden, it takes away all. It's just it melts everybody's. Well, the, the, all everything. moral authority has been stripped away from the government now. What'd you say? So, all moral authority right. uh, has been stripped That's away right. from the government. It's uh, David, David McGowan on this point, sorry to interrupt, but David McGowan in the paper, he writes, he goes, he goes, all things considered, it was a fairly innocuous lie. It's not like killing 3000 of your own citizens, destroying billions of dollars worth of real estate and then starting many world wars that have displaced, you know, caused many humanity. It's not like a lie like that, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, and that's the truth. It, but anyway, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, that's. I, I I guess what I'm saying is I see the origins in in something that I think originally could have been noble. Yeah. Um, I, I see Kennedy as probably somebody who uh, really did believe in uh, the evil of communism yeah. and believed in the the promise of capitalism yeah, and what yeah. America bring. Yeah. And so, but so many. Uh, egregious crimes throughout history have been committed by yeah. people with good intentions. You know? All right. I agree with you. All right. So let's dive in, guys. Episode two, Wagging the Moon Doggy. Here we go. I'm sorry it took so long. Everyone's probably tired and be like, we're going to bed now. Okay, here we go. Moon rocks. All right. One of the big things uh, people say is, what about all these cool moon rocks? How did they get those? The moon is, you know, the only source of moon rocks. So doesn't that prove we were there? That's, a, that's one of the debunker uh, claims um, that we have moon rocks. Well, actually, no. Moon rocks are not the only, or, or the moon is not the only source of moon rocks. Uh, moon rocks are available right here on Earth. Um, and if you have a question, Jabe, jump in or a comment. But um, they're called. Well, when you put them in your mouth, they make that weird noise. Yeah, and... no, those are pop rocks. Those oh. are different. All right, different. okay. Yeah. So uh, the moon rocks are called lunar meteorites uh, because the moon lacks a protective atmosphere. Um, crap busts in, bust in and hits the moon, right? And then those chunks that it, when it hits the moon, they always fly off into the atmosphere. And some of those make it to Earth and they hit Earth. And interestingly enough, um, the best place to find said moon rocks or meteor, lunar meteorites is in Antarctica. All this is fact. Right? It's all factual. Well, here's something that is pretty curious. Um, that in Antarctica just happens to be where a team of Apollo scientists, by the way, they were Nazi scientists that we imported, but hmm, never mind, sidebar. 
Nazi, or not Nazi scientists, Apollo science scientists led by a Werner von Braun. And I'm terrible at names. Anybody who knows that knows I have that disease from my dad. He can't say names right at the same time. And, and Dave knows that too. I'm pretty, I'm, it, you know, it's detrimental dysentery. Just that's an inside joke. But anyway, okay, going on. I'm sorry. So uh, Antarctica is the best place to find them. NASA took Apollo scientists to Antarctica in 1967, two years before we went to the moon. And for up till this time, they've still never given any kind of explanation why. Why did you, you seems like you would have your hands full getting ready to go to the moon and all. And you had, you found enough time to take some of your scientists and go to Antarctica. And then you can't ever explain why you went to Antarctica. And it's the best place to find moon rocks. Doesn't that sound a little suspicious to anybody else? Dave? Yeah, yeah, it does it does sound suspicious. Definitely suspicious. <laughs> Honestly, tell me what you really think. Yeah, no, no. I um I think I think uh uh this guy's greatest argument um that does make a lot of sense and resonates with me is why were we going up there like gangbusters when we went up there a bunch of times? Uh, back in the '60s, yeah, and, and then and and I think into the '70s, yeah, '72, uh, yeah, and then we tried in the '80s, but they fell out of the sky or whatever. But but why were we trying all that? That was the challenger, my friend. The different, <laughs> yeah, that was the challenger. <laughs> <laughs> but he does raise that point about how we went seven times to the moon, right? Without yeah, but a single I, failure. I, 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 it just stopped all of a sudden, and now we can't do it, or we can't seem to pull it off. You, you just know? raised a good point that he talks about that, how we went seven times flawlessly to the moon, right? Yet we have screwed up two, you know, to this point, two of our own space shuttle, you know, launches, just leaving Earth. We've effed that up twice, you know? And yet right. we're to believe in 1969, we went seven times to the moon flawlessly. It's pretty sad. Right. So... You remember those jokes in the 80s uh, with the Challenger one? Yeah, like. Yeah. What did she say to her husband before she left? Uh, you feed the dogs, I'll feed the fish. Dude. Uh, this has been enough. Of, no, I know. It's like, um, yeah, there's something about the the head and shoulder, the uh, what's-her-face. Um, what was one of the, the, the teacher that went up there? Um, these are terrible jokes. I can't believe we're talking about them live. Uh, what, something about the, they, she had dandruff because they found her head and shoulders. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't or, remember the joke. The pilot say right before they blew up, give me a light or something. <laughs> okay, light. so another, re another, another way we could have gotten moon rocks is a robotic probe. Some skeptics muse. So um, it's never been argued that we haven't send or that we haven't sent. Well, how does one verify that something is a moon rock? We're going to get there. We're going to get well, there. Well, you, you compare it to <laughs> like... NASA. Like, I'm going to yes, touch on that, but NASA. That's the, that's the funny thing is NASA is the only per, is the only organization who, who can authenticate moon rocks. NASA. So it's you know that's kind of that's Terry McAuliffe. Thank you, Kim. My sister just texted me the answer. So yeah, how did they know Terry McAuliffe had had dandruff? They found her head and shoulders lying on the beach. Okay, yeah. thanks, Kim, for that. Now I'm really now I'm really going to get banned. Um, anyway. Oh, that's funny. So, okay, robotic probes. Some people say, oh, well, hey, we could send... Why do they only serve Pepsi uh, at NASA? Why? Because they can't get 7-Up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, was the, I was the hit of third grade, man, when, when that all happened. I had to memorize. <laughs> I can just see you, man, little, Dave, little Davey in the back of the class with the jokes. Oh, man. Okay, no, hey, we got it. We got some points to get through here. So let me move on. Robotic probes. No one's ever said we haven't gotten robotic probes up there and back. It would be more plausible that we could do that, but still highly, highly skeptical and highly, highly. Um, uh, I have to believe because of, um, I don't know. My sister sent me a text. Um, sorry. Uh, it would be highly improbable that we've gotten anything there and back. The Soviets claim to do it, but it's skeptical. It's a very skeptical claim that they've sent a probe up there and back. It's possible that we've done that, but highly, highly improbable. Because to this date, 
China just landed a probe on the moon and everyone, you know, shat themselves over it and was like, oh my God, China landed it on the dark side of the moon. Big deal. We supposedly sent seven, or, you know, uh, 12 astronauts there seven different, th six different times or however many it was. So possibly we could have gotten them back through robotic probes, but highly unlikely. Uh, debunkers reluctantly admit, here's one thing that debunkers will reluctantly admit, that moon rock samples are virtually identical to Antarctica samples. So the samples you get from Antarctica are virtually identical to the samples that, again, NASA has. But when you take... Wait, I, it's like so the Fox I, 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 missed, I missed a beat there. I missed a beat there. So we had samples of the moon in Antarctica? Huh? What did you say? You're saying that the samples of the moon uh, from the moon match exactly samples from Antarctica? Yes. Yes. So, so you're saying rocks from Antarctica, or or was there supposed to, supposedly moon chips or moon crumbs no, yeah, in no, Antarctica? Yeah, Antarctica. Antarctica is one of the be is one of the best places that scientists can go and find lunar meteorites. For whatever reason, Antarctica. How did you huh? Meteorites. What'd you say? How do they know the meteorites? The geologists, baby, geologist scientists. I, I don't, I don't know. I'm not a geologist. Okay. But they know that just like they've they've found other meteorites that have hit, so they can it, test the substance. You're jumping all the way around. Like that's so weird. I wonder if that's Skype doing that to you, like changing your your window size all the time. But whatever, it's fine. We'll work through it. I'm intently yeah, listening. The camera? No. It's like changing. I haven't your, worked at all. That's weird. Okay. Any, yeah, now you're back up again. Okay, I'm just going to leave it be. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, they're virtually identical. And the funny part is NASA, again, is the only one who says what, who can authenticate a moon rock. But here it gets better. So NASA's actually given out petrified wood and to people and called it a moon rock. In um, the Dutch National Museum had been carefully safeguarding what was discovered in August 2009 that they were in reality possession of a piece of petrified wood. The moon rock had been a gift to the Dutch from the United States, the United State Department, and its authenticity had been reported had reportedly been verified through a phone call with NASA. I'm guessing the NASA was probably running a little low on meteorites uh, fragments and just figured the Dutch people wouldn't know. Or it could also be that the U.S was a little pissed off at the Dutch that they called bullshit on the first alleged moon landing. I didn't know that either, but the Dutch people weren't buying it. They're like, no, I don't buy this. But at any rate, um, it was petrified wood. So what NASA gave, or our State Department gave the Dutch for a museum, they later had it tested and found out it was petrified wood and it wasn't actually a meteorite or a moon rock. But not all moon rocks are fakes. Um, it just doesn't mean we collect them when we supposedly went there. They could have come as meteorites. They could have been other of otherworldly origin. Uh, how do we know for sure to have a control rock? This is getting to your point, Dave. How would we know for sure that this rock is a moon rock? Well, you have to have a control rock. And the only control rocks that is allegedly from the moon are held by NASA. But there's, pro there's a big problem with that. As the voice data, the original footage, the telemetry, the biomedical, all of this data was, um, you know, lost. Almost 90% of all the moon rocks we supposedly brought back and have given to other countries have been lost. And the only kind, there's only like, I believe 25 or 30 rocks still in existence that some countries still hold. And the only way to test those is against the control substance, which a control rock, which NASA has that says, yep, these are moon rocks. And, and apparently in the nineties, Clinton was giving everybody petrified wood. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, the argument flow chart goes, Dutch finds out moon rock is petrified wood. All other countries in possession of supposed moon rocks rush to have their rocks authenticated. No other country came forward with inauthentic, in, inauthentic moon rocks. Thus, moon rocks are real. Here's the problem. Countries can't test their moon rocks, like I just said, because they don't have them anymore. There's only 25 left. 
And the only people that say it's a controlled substance is NASA or a controlled rock, not a controlled substance, is uh, NASA. In an Associated Press article, nearly 270 rocks scooped up by U.S. astronauts were given to foreign countries by Nixon administration. Over 135 of the rocks from the Apollo 17 mission given away to nations or their leaders. Only about 25 have been located. Um, the outlook for tracking the rest is pretty grim because nobody can find them. And even if you do find them, the people that are going to tell you they're real it's nasa so the moon rock whole thing doesn't hold a whole lot of water that's what i'm trying to say dave thoughts go um absolutely that uh doesn't make sense to me uh uh kind of reminds me of what the catholic church did back in the medieval times selling pieces of the cross to people uh you know it seems pretty bogus yeah uh, the, the, the one thing I would say about all these articles, because I've read some of them, I haven't read all of them that uh, Steve sent them to me, is every time I listen to a debate uh, show or something that, you know, it's an argument between two parties, the first time you listen to the first side of the, the party, uh, the, the, the argument, you're just like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Of course, of course, of course, of course. And then you hear the other side and you hear rebuttals to it. Then you're, then you're not so sure. Then you're like, no, mm, no, no. And the, the only thing is I have not heard any official rebuttals to this guy's stuff. But in the first listen, at the first blush, in listening to this guy's stuff, it makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. And the the, the debunkers who, who go against the hoaxers are, are you know, um, very thorough, very uh, dedicated to debunking and are angry. I just... I'm just hacking people like with these and they have a lot of good they have a lot of good arguments i'm not gonna lie man i've read some of these arguments like you're talking about both sides i'm like yeah man i don't know maybe we did but when you just the the thing that i like about his his stance on these articles or his approach is he's coming from way more of a common sense approach like okay you can try to explain explain the van allen belt to me and the science of you know how quickly we went through and because it was thin material all the atoms passed through and all this but he raises some just seriously good common sense points as you go through. You're like, wow, that one is a really tough one. That's a very good circumstantial argument. I can't see how you really debunk this, you know? Um, one of the things, too, was the equipment. The people say, well, we can, we, can, we can prove we went there by the equipment that we left behind. Um, the photos have been taken of the equipment left behind by the Apollo astronauts on the surface of the moon. Like the descent stages of the lunar modules. How do you account for that? There's supposed to be a reflector up there, too. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Yeah. They can ping. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, basically, on the. Uh, I want to try to move along because I want to get to this one, to some stuff that's really fun and interesting. But on the equipment that's left can behind. We recap that a little bit. What'd you say? I said, can we recap it first? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, we're not going to recap right now. Um, it's certainly true that there have been numerous claims over the years that the various satellites or unmanned space probes or space telescopes were going to capture images that would definitely prove that man walked on the moon, thus settling the controversy once and for all. And in recent years, the debunkers have openly gloated whenever such announcements have been made, boldly proclaiming that all hoax believers will soon be exposed as the ignorant buffoons that they are. Despite all these promises, however, no such high-resolution photos or images have ever been produced, a fact that the debunkers seem to conveniently, conveniently overlook while forever, in rush, forever rushing to announce that the hoax theories are about to be discredited. Um, I want to skip ahead a little bit here. Um, basically, this was written in 2009, so at that point we didn't have any photos or that that was the first year any photos were released there's a whole lot of things we could touch on here about if we have um if we have equipment that can get up to the moon and orbit the moon and all that why not just throw a man in it if it's so easy why can't you know to go back why don't we just toss a man in one of those orbiters and send them up the other question that is raised is the hubble telescope we can see this the rings of saturn we can see up close on mars we can see deep into our, you know, our galaxy. 
and yet we can't get an up close and personal look at the moon that's kind of silly to me um the lro or the lunar um the the lunar rover orbiter um returned some images though just here i don't know you know several years ago it returned some images and this is the best images well this isn't there's some other ones too but let me pull this image up real quick like uh one second screen capture why is that not capturing that screen um quick dave tell a joke <laughs> just kidding uh, why, is my, why is my screen capture not working what do you <laughs> i don't know I don't know if you're going to approve of it. <laughs> no, well, if I'm not going to approve of it, then probably yeah. not uh, the best. Where have, you know what happened to it? Uh, maybe it's out there. There it is. Got oh, it. Boom. Got okay, cool. One. All right. I got one. You got one? It's invisible and smells like worms. What? What's that, Dave? A bird fart. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Kind of. Okay, here, let me uh, pull this over. Here. So, here's some of the images that we've got. Um, this is supposed to be the, let me pull this up, wait for it. Okay, so right here. Um, the images, however, hardly, so, so the LRO, NASA boldly announced that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, orbiter has returned its first imagery of the Apollo moon landing sites. The pictures show the Apollo mission lunar module descent stage sitting on the moon's surface as a long shadow from the low sun angle, which make the module's locations evidence. The LRC, LROC team anxiously awaited each image, said LROC Principal Investigator Mark Robinson of Arizona State University. We were very interested in getting our first peek at the lunar module descent stage just for the thrill and to see how well the cameras had come into focus. Indeed, the images are fantastic, and so, and so is the focus. Sounds promising, doesn't it? The images, however, hardly live up to the billing. They are, in fact, completely worthless. All they depict are tiny white dots on the lunar surface that could be just about anything, and the world would barely be visible at all without these handy long shadows from the sun angle. And the weird thing about those shadows is, in the very same NASA article, it says that because the sun was so low to the horizon, when the images were made, even subtle variations in top topography create long shadows. And yet, while it is perfectly obvious that there are several, the, uh, there are several more than just subtle variations on the, lun on the lunar topo topography in the image, the lunar surface in the image, I could have just said that, the alleged lunar modules are the only thing casting long shadows. So going back to this picture, as you see, he's talking about right here. So you have all these other, you know, um, you have all these other sweet dealios that are, you know, not casting any long shadows. And then all of a sudden, there it is. That's the lunar module. That's proof we went to the moon right there. See that? Now, I should have them up, but I don't. There's, there's more recent pictures that show little tiny white dots like this on different spots of the moon, right? And then they have them listed as this is where Apollo 11 landed and this is where Apollo, uh, you know, 10 or 9 or 7 or all the different Apollos landed. And then they have these really sweet little, you can look them up online, sweet little tracks that go, you know, through the, um, through the, the surface of the moon. And it is so silly because in reality, that would be ridiculously easy to um, ridiculously easy to fake with a little bit just a tiny little bit of photoshopping like it proves nothing and yet people act as though it's like that's proof we went man that's proof we went we can see pictures in lunar 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 tracks man that's proof it's ridiculous you need to look them up were you going to say something Dave uh, I was just looking at you nodding okay <laughs> okay, here's another interesting little picture. It says, given the benefit of the doubt, who's to say these images, if not terribly photoshopped, highly, were, um, highly likely? Weren't Soviet-era probes that allegedly went to the moon? Weren't the Soviet-era probes that allegedly went to the moon? Though, again, doubtful. Why, may you ask? So here's the thing. These are the pictures. That right there is a picture of the Soviet probe that went to the moon. Take that in for a second. Look at that thing. That is what they say 
went to the moon. I should probably make my... Oh, wait a second. Did I not cut over to that picture? Yeah, I'm like... <laughs> Can you guys even imagine that that's what they're saying right now? Okay, sorry about that. Here we go. All right, sorry. There we go. My bad. I'm an idiot. They say that's the image that went to the moon. That's the probe that went to the moon. Wow. That's the Soviet probe. I mean, it looks like it's ridiculous, man. Look at that. It looks like this is a keg welded on. And I just don't understand how that can be taken seriously. Moving forward, let's look at a couple other things. Actually, after studying the image above, one of the alleged lunar uh, Luna probes, I'm going to have to say that the Soviets were lying their asses off almost as much as NASA was. There is no way I'm going to buy into the notion that Soviet sent a freedom, a freeform abstract sculpture, um, which appears to have been constructed by Fred Sanford and Granny Clampett on a 234,000 mile from the Earth to the moon. Careful study of the central area of the photograph, however, does reveal why the spacecrafts were known as probes, if you know what I mean. I wonder if they're capable of any docking maneuvers. <laughs> oh, this guy's pretty funny. Um, Dave, up to this point, do you have some thoughts here? No. Yes. Go. <laughs> no, not really, Steve. Uh, I mean, you're just you're spouting facts, and it sounds right to me. I mean, that's, you know. I don't have any thoughts currently on that. Dave, am I boring you right now, man? No. Because we have like 35 people watching us. I'm just kidding. We don't <laughs> have that many. Anyway. All right. According to NASA, Japan and India have also sent unmanned orbiting spacecraft to the moon in recent years, as has China. As with ESA and the NASA orbiters, they have too, they too have failed to return any images of earthly artifacts left behind on the surface of the moon. If the hoax debunking websites are to be are to be believed, by the way, the reason that no one has returned to the moon in 37 years and now closer to 50 years is because we pretty much already tapped the celestial body of all the information it had to offer. That is also an excuse that is used by people to say we didn't go to the moon. There's nothing. We don't have anything. It doesn't have anything to offer us anymore. We don't need to go back. Um, a, a debunking article posted by ABC News, for example, quoted Val German, the president of the Central Missouri Astronomical, Astronomical, <laughs> Astronomical <laughs> Association. <That's true. laughs> As saying, there's no reason to go back. Quite frankly, the moon is a giant parking lot. There's just not much there. So you got to wonder why it is then that just about everyone seems to want to send unmanned probes there or to train enormously powerful telescopes on the moon's surface. What could, poss what could they possibly learn about a parking lot from that distance that our astronauts didn't already discover by actually being there? Which I kind of found a good point. You know, it's like the excuse that says we don't want to go back because it's a, it's a parking lot or it's because it, there's nothing to be found there is like saying if we sent, if aliens came and, and probed our Earth, I use the word probed lightly, if they came and probed our Earth, six different times would they pretend i mean would they i would if you know what i mean <laughs> yeah exactly with their petrified wood hey, um, they, they got the rocks uh, off to the moon <laughs> they wouldn't just act like you know they've everything's been found you know oh, well we know everything there is to know about the earth now granted the moon is quite a bit more desolate than the, the earth is but why would China go back now? And why does China say there's great resources of uh, water on the or on the moon? And why has China went to all the great lengths to supposedly land a probe on the moon? And I say supposedly because I think they probably did. But man, watching that video of the lunar, the Chinese lunar rover landing on the moon looks fake as hell. Is it just me, or is it just like it looks silly? Have you seen that video, Dave, of them landing the the probe on the moon? No, I haven't. Do you have somebody sneaking up on you? Is that why you keep looking over your shoulder? No, I'm looking at you. What do you mean you're looking at me? You can't see me in the in the. the I can the see box? you looking at me, but 
I would feel better if you looked at the camera because I keep Uh-oh. thinking you're thinking somebody's pissed. I guess I have to look this way. And then I'd have to look this way yeah, back at you, which is awkward. Yeah. So we're supposed to be like talking so together. You know what I mean? It should be like this, right? Yeah, that's true. I guess. I see what you're doing. I see where your head's at. Okay, Dave. So talking about your lasers, um, debunkers point out the lasers like you're talking about. Uh, as the story goes, the astronauts on Apollo 11, Apollo 14, and Apollo 15 all allegedly left small lasers targeting on the lunar terrain. One of them can still be seen in the Na- official NASA photo re- reproduced below. I'll show you a picture of that. I was understood that it was a reflector. What's that? Like, like you know, I always understood that it was a reflector, though. Like, it was like off of one of your bicycles or something. Uh, like a reflector that they put up there that we can shoot a laser at from earth right and then see it reflect back at us yeah it's that's, a little that's more one than, of the it's that's little, how i it, and that's true it's a little more than a I mean, um, it's a little more than a a bicycle reflector i i thought i had a picture of it on here i guess i don't but yeah exactly it's like a square more, more than a bicycle reflector but you know well you said bicycle and, reflector i i said like the ones that you have on your bicycle reflector, but it's not, but it's not anything it's, uh, <laughs> on a bike. It's completely different. <laughs> no, I left a set of Huffy bars with the little tassels on the end. Yeah. <laughs> and that if you look closely, you can see the solar winds blowing the tassels on the Huffy uh, yeah. handlebars. There is no wind in space. Uh, solar winds. No, there's no air. I don't know how that works, but we're going to touch on that later too. Okay, so uh, oh, so you're right. They, a, I'm they, giving you they, shit. They didn't, they didn't leave a laser there, right? They left a reflector they that left we a can shoot. There. A, Allegedly, they left a reflector not there. A bicycle reflector, completely different. Completely but different. A reflector, not a, but a reflector, reflector nonetheless. Yes. So scientists. Yeah. So they say that. So. Um, so that scientists back home could then bounce lasers off the target to precisely gauge the distance of the moon from Earth. So that's allegedly what they say. Again, they could have been placed there robotically, you know, just uh, for, you know, benefit of the doubt. But here's the other thing. We've been able to bounce lasers off the moon before even being to the moon. In December 1966, National Geographic reported that scientists at MIT had been achieving essentially the same result for four years by bouncing a laser off the surface of the moon. The New York Times added that the Soviets had been doing the same thing since 1963. So the whole bouncing a laser thing, it's bullshit. And then people say, well, you can see them. No, you can't see them. You can't see them. That's not true. You can't see them. People say you can, you can't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You're like, okay, moving on. Okay, let me let me put this stuff up. Maybe it just give a different look for people for a minute. I'm going to move my camera on top of you, Dave, because I feel like I should be bigger than you because I'm better than you. <laughs> just kidding. I don't think that. I'm really bummed about the whole fact that my stuff hasn't turned up from you yet. Here, we're going to cut over to this cut just to change things up a little bit. Okay, so um, moving on. All right, I like this. This is better. I like it. I know. We're kind of like, it's like we're in space kind of. Okay, sweet. Oh, yeah, you can look straight up and I can look down. Dave. Yeah, how do I do it? Dave, <laughs> don't be like that. It's so That's funny. Funny. I feel like we're oh, a great one. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, our, our minds work alike. I thought we were in a Brady Munch. Are you okay? Look like you. Yeah, fine. yeah. Okay. Lost um, my light. You what? I lost my light. Uh, I, I'm, I'm coming back. Okay. My reflector uh, that I reflector? put up. Yeah, my reflector. Oh, man. We've been doing this for an hour, and we still got people watching. You guys are awesome. Thank you, Kim, Carol, Scott, and Jesse. <laughs> uh, let's get stuff. All right. So, hey, going on with the, the – the, yeah. So, we've been able to bounce, moon, bounce lasers off the moon, so that proves nothing. Lunar modules. Arguably the greatest technological achievement was the design of the lunar modules. Has anyone, by the way, ever really taken a good look at one of those contraptions? I mean, in a detailed, up-close look. I'm guessing that the vast majority of people have not. But luckily, we can quickly remedy that situation because I happen to have a couple really good high-resolution images that come directly from the people at NASA. Wait for it. There it is. 
Look at that high resolution, amazing picture of us on the moon. That was taken from the moon, and that's an amazing picture. Later episodes, we're going to get into the whole debacle about film on the moon with radiation and how that would have, how you would take a picture. And this picture supposedly was taken from a chest mounted camera where somebody couldn't even focus it. They couldn't set any apertures. They couldn't set any film speed. They, it was, it was attached to their chest and they're just like, pink, um, pink, um, pink. That's how they took the pictures up there. And they turned out this badass. But speaking of this badass, look right up here. That is amazing. That looks like, I mean, I wish, can I blow this up? How do I zoom in on this bad Mamba Jumbo? Um, there's got to be a way to like view and like zoom, right? How do you, oh, there it is right there. Okay, cool. Let's do this. Boom. Um, that is some sweetness. Look at that. That's like, uh, they got tinfoil here. And then they got some sheet metal. They got sheet metal here that they, they bolted together, right? And then they got some mylar like wrapping paper stuff down here. <laughs> and now keep a picture of this in mind because our next segment we're going to get into right here, we'll come back to this picture. I'm going to leave it right there. We're going to come back to that. Um, oh, I could have just done that. I'm an idiot. Why don't I just do this? Jeez, going back and forth. I'm such a moron. Okay, yeah, we're just going to do that. What do you think, Dave? Is that good? There it is, too. Look at that. That's sweet. Yeah, it looks good. <laughs> okay, so um, while what is depicted in this images may initially appear to the untrained eye to be some kind of mock-up that someone cobbled together in their backyard to make fun of NASA... I can assure you that it is actually an extremely high-tech manned spacecraft capable, spacecraft capable of landing on the surface of the moon. And incredibly enough, it was also capable of blasting off of the moon and flying 69 miles back up into the lunar orbit. Though not immediately apparent, it is actually a two-stage aircraft. The lower half, the part that looks like a tubular aluminum framework covered with mylar and old Christmas wrappings, being the descent stage. And the upper half, the part looks like as though it was cobbled together from an old air conditioning ductwork and is primarily held together, as can be seen in the close-up, with zippers and golden tape, being the ascent stage. <laughs> Let's look at those one more time. This here went, this here is what landed on the moon and then took back off on the moon. This right there. Look at this. We're to believe that is how they did it. Moving on. The upper half, of course, is the most sophisticated portion, being capable of lifting off and flying with enough power to break free of moon's gravity and reach lunar orbit. It also, of course, possessed sophisticated enough navigational cap cap uh, capabilities for it to locate, literally out of the middle of fucking nowhere, the command module that it had to dock with in order to get the astronauts safely back to Earth. It also had to catch the command module, which was orbiting the moon at a leisurely 4,000 miles per hour. Dave? <laughs> Are you speechless right now? <laughs> I don't know what to say, Steve. <laughs> but we'll get all to all of that a bit later. Um, okay. So here, this is the part I wanted to get to, and we're, we're getting close to the end. We're a little over an hour. We're getting close to the end. How did they get their luggage on board? And a dune buggy. <laughs> This is the greatest part. This is one of the greatest parts, I think, and literally out of all the scientific reasons of why we went and how we did it, this is the one where I want a scientist to explain it to me, what we're about ready to go through. How did they get everything on board the modules that they were going to need to su successfully complete their mission? According to NASA, the modules were excluding the landing pads only about 12 feet in diameter. So 12 feet in diameter. I'll have this picture up. We can blast back to it. Boom. That. Right there. That beauty. Take into account the space the components would take up. Components and electronics circa 1960 tech. They would have been a bit clunky and large. Think about that. About how they said the computers that sent the man to the moon took up a whole room. 
and we're about one one thousandth as powerful as what we hold in our hand today. And the computers that sent them there basically took up a whole huge room, right? What about the electronics on board that module that sent them to the moon and back? What about that? That seems kind of interesting, does it not? Is that, am I the only one who's like, that seems weird? Seems a little far-fetched. Thank you. So, take into account the space components. Okay, just did that. They'd be a bit clunky. Now take into account they need power supplies, multiple power supplies. Descent rocket thrust for landing without disturbing the moon topography. We'll more on this later in a different episode. Ascent rockets to propel them off the surface and back into the orbit. Then random smaller stabilization rockets, the bicycle horn looking thingy majiggers right here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Wrong picture. Got to go to the next one right here. So this is a breakout of what the module, the modules were. So I'm going to keep that up. We're going to come back to it. Oh, I guess it's right there. <laughs> Could have been a little more prepared. <laughs> fuel, fuel components. They needed to go 69 miles worth of ascent fuel. One sixth Earth's gravity is still formidable amount needed to thrust. It still creates tides here on Earth 234,000 miles away. So it isn't like the, um, the moon had no, no, no atmosphere, right? Like, or, or no gravity. It has gravity. It has enough gravity to affect our, our, our tides here on Earth. It's one-sixth what the Earth's gravity is. So there's still a lot of force pushing down on objects. Not a lot, but there's force. Next, you have to include everything required to keep ourselves alive and well. So, we're going to need to, let's recap real quick. We're going to need clunky electronics. We're going to need power supplies. We're going to need rockets on this. Then we're going to need the gas for it, right? Next, we're going to need to include things like a place to sleep, a place to poop, food and water, oxygen, making sure we have a little bit of extra in case problems arise, Apollo 13. Something to recharge our spacesuits with, like needed oxygen, for our slow motion lunar surface walks, which we'll talk about later, exhibiting our 8 to 10 inch vertical leap in one at one sixth the Earth's gravity, which is hilarious. I touched on that in the first one, talking about how w the, the only thing the guys did on the, the moon was hit a, hit a golf ball. That's all they did. They drove a dune buggy and they hit a golf ball. If you were in one-sixth the gravity, don't you think you would have done more than just hit a golf ball and walked in slow motion? And the other thing in the recap missed that I'm going to touch on now and then we're going to keep going is there all the footage that we've seen of the moon, Dave, I don't know if you know this, but all the footage we've seen of the moon is in actuality not the actual footage of the... Um, did you know that? It's not actual footage from the... And told me that. What's so that? I knew that. You had told me that, okay, and so that's how I knew that. Yeah, how they actually refilmed and reshot the uh, the film. Everything that was broadcasted to the people that watched the landing live was shot off of a camera looking at a monitor that was supposedly feeding live into that monitor, and then they then the the film crew filmed that and shot that out to everybody that was sitting at home behind their black and white televisions. And that's how they saw the moon landing. The original footage has lost now. No one has ever seen it. It's never been broadcasted, which also was an interesting point. If you had the technology to, to, to transmit the video from the moon to the earth, 234,000 miles away, and you could stream that video to us in 1969, why couldn't you have figured out how to plug the right wires in the back of whatever box that was coming into and then just feed that same feed right out live. Instead, you had to film it on another monitor. That is That to me is also like, how do you explain that bullshit? That's, that's insanity. Um, Wouldn't they also face the beef? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, place to poop and pee. Yeah, yep. Well, it, so yeah. <laughs> they could have sold themselves, I guess. Uh, they, would yeah. also, they also would have needed something to recharge. Oh, I said that, the oxygen. They also would have needed a top-of-the-line HVAC system, that which can compensate for a 260-degree Fahrenheit to a negative 260-degree temperature swing. 
because in the sunlight it's 260 degrees on the moon and in the shadows it's 260 degrees in the moon negative 260 degrees in the moon that's the temperature swing they have up there so they would have needed some sort of hvac air conditioner system that was actually that could work in those extremes number one and number two that could work without air <laughs> which air conditioning units don't work without air they use air as they work so if you don't have any air in the atmosphere how are you discharging your heat where are you discharging your heat to it's or you know vice versa it how did they figure that out and incidentally on that point looks like you have a question but incidentally on that point recently nasa has said that is a problem they have to work out before they can go back nasa has came out and said and i'll have the articles in the following some of these following episodes nasa has came out and said in order for us to go back to the moon we got to figure out a suit system that's going to work because of the extreme the extreme temperature swings on the moon we got to figure out a a suit system that's going to work well, we figured yeah. it out in 1969. Why can't we just use that tech? Why can't we use that? Oh, that's right. We don't have any of the blueprints. We don't have any of the information anymore. All that's been lost. So they have to now recreate the wheel with a billion times more techno- uh, technology you know, at their disposal. Maybe not a billion, but a lot. And they can't figure that out, but in 69 they could? That seems pretty interesting to me. Sounds improbable. Yes, thank you, Dave. You're getting sleepy, man. No, no, I got to bounce in five, so you do. I'm hanging with you, though. Yeah, I'm hanging with you. Okay, I know this is taking forever. Okay, so now let's just go through the other things. Now, hear about the rest of the stuff we need. We're gonna need space. Um, we're gonna need some spare parts for our space parts. If shit breaks, we can't go to AutoZone. So we're gonna need some spare space parts. Then we're gonna need our pretend laboratory testing equipment for the tests we're conducting. Then we're gonna need room to bring back all the samples. And finally, we're gonna need the dune buggy. We're gonna need to take a dune buggy up, and that needs to fit somewhere in here, guys. We need to bring that dune buggy to the moon. How did we get the dune buggy to the moon? Somewhere in here, we put it in here. Well, NASA has that all taken care of for us. It's real simple how we got that to the moon. Don't worry. The Na- NASA, according to NASA, they have a 10 foot long dune buggy that they could fit in, that they could fold up into a suitcase a large size of a suitcase and unfold it when they got onto the moon. That's how they got it up there. Yeah. They have two two feet. Their, their, their dune buggy is two feet short of what the di- diameter of the lunar module is. But don't worry. They have it all figured that out. That was an overhead compartment. <laughs> right? They could have put it on a luggage rack, you know? Maybe. And here's the other thing. Why do you need a dune buggy for space? <laughs> Why would you need a dune buggy for space? It's cool. And really, the only question is it that it makes it makes really, honestly it was supposed to fold up into a suitcase. Yeah, that's supposed to fold up into a suitcase. That's what NASA <laughs> said. That fold that folded up. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. I don't need to point at it. That folded up into a new uh, a suitcase right there. That did. And yeah, really, that's 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 really, it's such bullshit. This is the common sense stuff that people are like, well, we could have made it through the Van Allen belt because of this, and we could have done this because of that. Really? How do we get the damn dune buggy up there? You're going to tell me that folded up? And now we're not even done, though, with, what, with the kind of stuff that you would need. You'd need batteries, lots and lots of batteries. This is the stuff they said we took to the moon in that. We took all this shit to the moon in that. I'm going to get through this, Dave. Give me two more minutes before you have to bounce. Batteries. We have to have batteries to run our communication system, our oxygen system, our HVAC system, our cabin lights, our TV cameras, our transmitters, our testing equipment, our spacesuits, our dune buggy. Side note, NASA has done nothing, has done something very odd, by the way, with the lunar module that is has only uh, that that has on display for the mu. Oh, sorry, I'm be- I got to retake that back. You've got me rushed now, Dave. The the uh, picture now they have. The picture you don't have to have me finish I, up, bro. I, I want to finish these points before you go. The in the NASA Museum, what they have done with the model of the lunar or, uh, of the uh, Apollo spacecraft and the 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 uh, um, fake astronauts, the little model astronauts, they've actually made the lunar module a little bit bigger. And then they made the astronauts on their display a little bit smaller to give it the effect that the, the actual lunar module was bigger than it really was. 
But just keep in mind, all of this stuff needs to fit in this thing right here. All of the stuff they say they're needing to take needs to fit in here and bring back. It's absolutely insanity. And um, the batteries covered all that side notes. And here's uh, one of the final points I'll make. And then we can... Um, yeah, this is the final point. So we got. I can do it in two minutes. <coughs> um, perfect execution. NASA managed to pull off six perfect takeoffs from the surface of the moon and understand here people that they didn't they did that amazingly enough with completely untested technology untested technology because you can't there's no place on earth to test this technology they figured out how to land six different times perfectly on the moon and take back off perfectly from the moon when they did it at six times with untested technology you can't duplicate the conditions of the moon here on home. And since no one had ever been to the moon, they didn't know exactly how to replicate that and how, what was gonna, how it was going to act. The conditions on the moon are, to say the least, a little bit different than here on Earth. The gravitational pull is one-sixth of what it is here. Then there's a whole lack of atmosphere thing going on there. They decidedly unearthly temperatures there. And, of course, the high levels of space radiation. The ability of the modules to actually blast off from the moon and fly was, at best, a theoretical concept. So that's probably kind of one of the final points that I had to make here. Think about being the astronaut that, that, that says, you know, they say to you, hey, we think we got this. We think you're going to be okay. Tr just, just, just trust us. Try it. So we're going to shoot you 234,000 miles into, this, into space. And um, I think you can land this bad boy on the moon. You can do it. That is bullshit, man. I know this stream was a little more unorganized than I wanted it to be, and I'm sorry. Um, but what are your thoughts on some of this stuff, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> that was great, Dave. That's I, what I, has to you, I, I bet you that's how everyone else feels too right now. Uh, it's a lot to take in. It's... Uh... <laughs> What were you thinking yeah. about, Dave? No, just tell me no, what your was, thoughts were. I, I was listening to what you were saying. <laughs> but uh, it's it's uh, food for thought. It's good stuff. Yeah, it is. Good stuff. Well, hey, dude, I appreciate you being here. I'm sorry it took too long. I'm going to streamline this out a little more for the next one. But do you want to come by on the next one and maybe actually do a little homework before you come on and, and, and watch one of my videos or something? Yeah, yeah. No, no, this, this is, <laughs> it's been good. It's been good. Uh, I'm just kidding, man. Um, all right, dude. Well, I appreciate you hanging out, yeah. man. Yeah, likewise, dude. And, um, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the suitcase thing was, was, uh, that was hard to swallow. I, I, I think, you know, fitting that, that, uh, the doom buggy into the suitcase would be, that would be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be a little bit of a crazy situation. So, all right, my friend. Well, um, I will let you, I'll let you bounce out. I appreciate you joining me. It's fun. Um, I'll call you later or we'll talk later. And um, anyways, man, everyone. Thank Dave for right. coming. And, uh, later. See you. All, right. all right, man. Bye. All right, guys. Um, cut over to here. Um, I apologize for the stream being long and being a little um, disjointed. I'm still trying to figure out the formats, how I want to do these. I'm going to have some recaps, and I think I'm going to get these a little more streamlined. Um, I, I guess it was just my family watching, so um, I'll get ridiculed by them, but probably not too many other people. So there wasn't a lot of people watching. Uh, I think we had uh, quite a few at one time. By quite a few, I mean more than two. And... Um, yeah, it's good times. So, um, having said that, I think I might just end this part of the stream, but I am going to be doing a couple more videos uh, this weekend on other stuff going on in our our world regarding politics and you know some cultural things going on and some things locally here in Portland that I think need to be called out um, with our local government. And uh, so I hope you guys tune in. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And please don't forget to subscribe if you guys haven't, all two of you. And, um, and then hit the bell notification. So until next time, 
SJ, I'll do a recap of this too. I don't know. I'll figure it out. It's we got to figure something out. Anyways, SJG perspective. Signing off. Have a good night, guys. Take it easy. Bye. And that didn't work. <laughs> and try that again. I'm an idiot. <laughs>